Honorable uh, participants, distinguished guests, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to you. I'm most honored to have been invited by the people behind this event, Ri Pera and Bijan, to deliver this address alongside some famous names who are here on the stage with me. I'm also very glad to be informed that most participants in this uh, uh, event are leaders in the field of developmental decision-making and they will determine much of what our own cities and societies will morph into in the years to come. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the 21st century will probably redefine the world landscape following an era of what we may call the Great Reset. That is, if we do not first destroy ourselves in madness, in a nuclear holocaust, as the old world and the old new world resist ascendance of the reawaken the old, old world. The world is still in the midst of worldwide economic expansion, albeit a little bit slower in the USA and the West, and a lot faster in the Far East, in Southeast Asia, South Asia, the Middle East, in Africa, and South America. Everywhere we go, the places we traditionally define as a place to grow up in, to study, to live, work and play, have been ripped apart for crass capital gain, uprooting and displacing communities, destroying ageless legacies and senses of history, patrimony, belonging and place. Creating great wealth for some, and greater deprivation for many others. In the great rush to, check, to catch up with and to overtake governments and capitalists vie with one another to destroy the ecology and the environment. The hungry poor also contribute the share to this degradation, but in their case, in order merely to survive in the world's rat race. Nowhere else can you see the greatest of these excesses than in the emerging economies playing catch up in a mad rush. This is the greatest pity because most of us here are from the emerging economies and it is our patrimony that is being destroyed with our knowledge and sometimes our own connivance. And sometimes not because we like to be passive to all this development, much less to partake in it, but that we know of no better way. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there is an industry that we call the sense of place industry. It is a global industry, including but not limited to the location of homegrown industries economies of local agglomeration, or otherwise known as linkages, transportation, international trade, economic development, real estate, built environment, gentrification or urban renewal, ethnic economies, gendered economies, core periphery development and relationship, the microeconomics of urban form, the relationship between the environment and the economy and globalization. Sense of place is an umbrella term encompassing all place-based economic sectors. It is actually 
a multi-trillion dollar marketplace. It is actually the world's largest industry, invariably related to the notion that places compete with each other for people, for resources and business. It is a segmented fraternity with hundreds of definitions which could easily be concluded as a single discipline, a sense of place. The main concern is never about the understanding and defining of various terms under the sense of place fraternity. It is simply about expressing the true content of the place, supported by its inhabitants with pride. It is not a zero-sum game. It could be equitable and less complicated, made easier by participative and democratic development. Now, after the global financial crisis of 2008, Asia grew at more than 6% each year, outperforming the troubled West. And not just East Asia that I'm talking about, but also South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America. While the West, barring Germany and Scandinavia, floundered, the gravity-defying feat substantiated the idea of Asia's rise to close the gap with the developed economies. Now, gravity seems to be catching up with Asians, Africans, and Latin Americans. In the Asian century, the triumphal regions of Asia, Africa, and Latin America are expected to thrive economically but will face the immense challenges of poverty, burgeoning populations, vast slums, housing demolitions, and natural disasters. The rise of the Asian economies over the last 50 years, which started with Japan in the late 60s, in the late 50s, and then spreading to Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore, and later to the rest of Southeast Asia, with China and India taking the lead since the 1980s, has been mainly a story of production. With a notable exception of India, Asia's rising prosperity has been largely driven by an export-oriented economic model. Asia has been the world's biggest factory, a gigantic, increasingly integrated production machine churning out almost everything. For the last half century, the West, and above all, the United States, has voraciously consumed whatever Asia produced. In the process, Asian countries have almost uninterruptedly run trade and current account surpluses. The United States, by contrast, has run deficits that have ballooned in recent years, between 2003 in 2008, for instance, the U.S. current account deficit averaged U.S. $700 billion, equal to around 5% of GDP. Almost half of the U.S. deficit was with the countries of East Asia. In short, the last several decades, the U.S. has been the main consumption engine and Asia the main production engine for the global economy. But this dynamic is now changing. Asia's pro-export policies, essentially low wages and cheap currencies, are becoming increasingly obsolete and unsuitable. This has become increasingly evident after the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. Asia is in the midst of changing the growth model. The previous almost single-minded focus on investment and production for exports is shifting towards domestic consumption and local infrastructure development. Yes, we are talking about the arrival and the rise of the Global South as the world's next generation of travel, trade, investment 
and talent destination. This rapid growth of past decades is written into the present landscape. Socio-economic growth has transformed cities, raised income levels, spurred urbanization and technology, changing the way we live and work. And just as the transformation of the region has generated a tremendous amount of wealth for Asians, Africans and Latin Americans over the past decade, the developments of the coming decade are likely to generate new opportunities for trending place making and branding across the world. More wealth will likely be generated as a result of demographic changes, urban and infrastructure growth, the continued rise of the middle class and the expansion of Asian consumerism in the foreseeable future. The shift in economic gravity from the West to the East is the biggest structural shift underway in the global economy today. Over the coming years, Asia, Africa and Latin America will play an even more influential role in the global economy as its economic engine switches gear from production to consumption. In the Global South, the socio-economic growth continues despite political uncertainties in many countries. The secular growth of Asian, African, and Latin American places and middle classes fuels both global investment and consumption in the sense of place enactment through tangible as well as intangible assets building. The re-emergence of the Global South on the global stage is a huge drama with many subplots. Despite myriad issues, the growth in the Global South has become organic. Hundreds of millions of people are on the move, determined to do better for themselves and their future generations. Everything is in short supply. Social infrastructure, mobility, public amenities, clean water, utilities, resilience and happiness. The list is very long indeed. Therefore, the opportunities are huge for everybody. It is by tapping into Asian century that the advanced economies of Europe and North America will reinvent themselves and undo the flaws of too easy capital. The great reset the world, which is what it all amounts to, will not, I think, be smooth. Despite the efforts and deployment of global strategies, there will be financial, economic, political and social turbulence. There is much to be concerned about, challenges and opportunities, of dangers and hopes. By sharing perspectives and insights, our coming summit, today's summit, World Sense of Place Summit, My Place, My Brand, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, should be refreshing, inspiring and energizing. The summit highlights a sense of place virtues and helps make the world more collaborative and sustainable. In the 21st century, places worldwide will become the focal points of economic development, geopolitical competition and collaboration while balancing needs for long-term sustainability. With increasing population demands, places will also become the centers of human habitat and cultural development. However, the challenges of developing and managing sense of place will grow increasingly more complex. Integrated place-based solutions will be needed to create optimum economic, environmental and social outcomes. The emergence of key trends of the 21st century, globalization, individualism, merging, acceleration, high tech, high touch, demographics, urbanization and migration is posing challenges 
everywhere. The urban population explosion, which is building up, positions cities as the engines for developing the society of the future, and means that we are at a defining point in how our future sense of place unfolds. The Asian century poses us the defining challenge to maintain the authenticity of places across the world while confronting the fear of differences and the hubris of modernizing ambition. At a time in which debt-driven places, driven by retail consumption against a broader societal alienation, we urgently need to connect the real concern of socio-economic development to our unsettled social condition and natural environment. There is a great need to promote social vitality of places with attractions morphing into the universally recognized economic value of destination culture. That old sage of urban planning, Sir Ebenezer Howard, who a long time ago, in fact 115 years ago, wrote his book, Garden Cities of Tomorrow. And he said, whatever may be, whatever may have been the causes which have operated in the past and are operating now to draw the people into the cities, those causes may all be summed up as attractions. And it is obvious, therefore, that no remedy can possibly be effective which will not present to the people, or at least to considerable portions of them, greater attractions than our cities now possess, so that the force of the old attractions shall be overcome by the force of the new attractions which are to be created. Each city may be regarded as a magnet, each person as a needle, and so viewed it is at once seen that nothing short of the discovery of a method for constructing magnets of yet greater power than our cities possess can be effective for redistributing the population in a spontaneous and healthy manner. And that was said 115 years ago. As for the self-guiding communities, well, they have been submerged by elected officials who pay more attention to real estate developers than to community planners, and torpedoed by economic recession on the one hand and citizens' tax revolts on the other. Sometimes the arrogance of government leadership and planners who encourage people to migrate out of the native places the monolithic architectural projects that swallow all places whole and the stunning rate of highway construction that molds cities around space for vehicles embody so much self-interest that not even new socio-political revolution could thwart their forward flow. We therefore invite all of us to imagine the world if we allow developers who build and financial institutions that finance the construction of new places that rips out a place's heart, driven only by the dollars and cents to be made. Every country, city, and any place at all must prioritize value on great leadership that will lead its citizens forward and sustain its global competitiveness. Thank heavens, more individuals are voluntarily coming forward to become place champions, emerging from small towns to cities. The late Jane Jacobs, the Canadian-American journalist, activist, who wrote that book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, way back in 1961, said, Neighborhood is a word that has come to sound like a valentine. As a sentimental concept, neighborhood is harmful to city planning. 
It leads to attempts at warping city life into imitations of town or suburban life. Sentimentality plays with sweet intentions in place of good sense. Today's global citizens confront a fundamental question. How do people from vastly different cultures and economic circumstances learn to accommodate one another's needs within the confines of very dense and complex mobility of today's world population? The world today is losing its sense in pursuit of fast growth GDP. Through abject capitalization of land and grandiose projects. Cities across the world are racing to build the largest and unsustainable utopias to express grandeur without restraint and a real sense of place. The only way that we can continue to live out the economic fantasy driven by speculation and flawed perception that we see all around us is by financially abusing and depriving the next generation's access to precious natural resources. We can continue to de derive opportunistic value from enacting sense of place, but in a meaningful and sustainable approach. Therefore, I wish to invite you, let us come together to enact the thriving industry, the multi-trillion dollar sense of place industry aiming for mainstream impact to generate opportunities that are devoted to addressing the distinctive quality and character of our regions, our cities, our towns and rural areas. Can we thrive in a knowledge-driven era where middle classes around the world are crippled with massive debts and are not having access to the real sense of place? In reinventing new places, we are facing with unprecedented expenditure, increasing disenfranchised youth, displacing native citizens, compromising existing environment, and the declining of all socio-economic structures across the world. The arrival of this Asian century should derive from local social reality and its natural environment. This is the real challenge at the very heart of this Asian century, which gives us a rare opportunity to define place-based economy to fulfill every place's potential across the world. It is a catalyst of the next global revolution for new wealth creation. Imagine the globalized world without a sense of place. The World Sense of Place Summit, My Place, My Brand Summit 2013, is, I understand, the world's first congregation of the Sense of Place industry, with diverse delegates and audiences consisting of leaders, experts, practitioners, consultants, governmental officials, academicians, and other stakeholders. It is held here at the Putrajaya International Convention Center, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, today and we showcase that place making and place branding activities are inextricably linked to biodiversity, people and economy. At the summit, you'll hear firsthand about new perspectives and ideas that are providing new approaches for place making and place branding. Working with communities and governments and across sectors and country borders, the summit will demonstrate that it is possible to bring about changes necessary for a positive future of our place, our village, our town, our city, our state, our country, our region, and our world. And with that, I hope you'll all enjoy the summit and imbibe of its full potentials. Thank you very much. Thank you.